Welcome back to my channel. Thank you for showing us so much love through your likes and comments. It's been amazingly gratifying to see that this is helping everyone. If you like what you see, please click the bell icon and subscribe to the channel to get instant alerts on our content. And don't forget to share it with everyone you know. Today, we're back to talk about the second part in the sleep series. Last week, we spoke about the importance of sleep and the significance of the circadian rhythm. Today, we're continuing on that journey to identify what are the different stages of sleep, how much sleep is enough for an adult, what is the effect of alcohol on that sleep, and finally, does the mattress affect our sleep? So tune in and hope you like it. Welcome back, everyone. I have the pleasure tonight of having one of my good friends from Denver who practiced with me um, as a uh, pulmonologist and sleep physician while I was a cardiac surgeon uh, in Denver. And he is going to talk to us today a little bit about sleep because that's what he, he does. And that's something which we all need more of. When you go to sleep, what happens? There's stages of sleep. There's so REM, rapid eye movement, non-REM. Tell me what happens when I go and lie down and I'm looking at the ceiling or I've got my eyes closed and sleeping on a pillow. What happens to us as we drift off? And then, you know, there's stage one, stage two, stage three, and then nine sure. minutes later, you're in REM and then you keep going back and forth. And then, you know, you don't remember your dreams, but if you wake up, you do, right? So tell me sure. how that process works. So, 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 Think of the brain as really having three stages of being, okay, three states. There's awake, like you and I are right now talking to each other, and we know what our brain waves look like, these fast brain waves, a lot of processing. There's what we call non-REM sleep, where the brain slows down and things are much more calm. And then there's REM sleep. And what's really unique about REM sleep is, is if you look at the brain waves alone, they're just as active as they are right now. If, so if I were to look at your brain waves right now and in REM sleep without any other data, I couldn't tell the difference. Oh, very the brain's very active, but there's other things that happen physiologically. So when we first start to fall asleep, we hit what's called stage one, which is kind of that twilight sleep. You're between asleep and awake. You know you're kind of sleepy, but you hear the kids, you hear a little noise. You're kind of going in and out of sleep. And then we hit what's called stage two, which is where 50% of the time most adults will spend their sleep. You know, that's the majority of what we sleep. Um, and then there's delta sleep and, or deep sleep called stage three sleep. And that's when the brain really shuts down. It's very big, slow waves. The blood pressure is very low. Our breathing is very low. That's the restorative process for the brain. I've heard your that's, temperature also goes down. Is that true? Well, and, and, and in the stage three sleep, not as much. We, we tend to keep things very stable, but that's what helps with our muscles. It helps with our joints. It helps, you know, that's the true restorative process. And stage three is really important in kids because that's where growth hormone is released. And that's what helps kids to grow. Very interesting. And so if we disrupt their sleep, they tend to gain weight, but not grow as tall. So then they become overweight as children. And then once they hit their teenage years and those bones fuse, that's it. So they don't reach their height potential. So that's why sleep in children is so important for that growth. And there's a lot of um, regulations of sugars and different things. And then within the first, like you said, first hour and a half or two, we hit REM sleep. And REM sleep is where we think the brain really processes the day. That's where short-term memory is taken into long-term memory. And what's really interesting is when you look at REM sleep, it is such a chaotic time for the body. Our blood pressure can spike up, spike down. Our heart rate spikes up and spike down. That's when we tend to lose temperature control, you know, where we often get really hot or really cold. Um, and then, but it's so critical for the brain. You know, without REM sleep, the brain doesn't function well. So if you take a medicine or something happens where you don't get REM sleep on a night, the next night your brain will rebound back to get a lot more of it. When you look at babies, half of their time is in REM sleep. So that's the brain developing. Um, and it's really interesting. And what's really interesting in REM sleep is we actually paralyze ourselves from our neck down. So we don't act out what we're thinking about in our dreams. Um, but you know, you're right. It's really interesting how sleep is so integral into memory allocation. We don't completely understand it, but you know, the best analogy I've heard, and I've kind of, you're like me, you're kind of a computer guy as well. The way I've looked at it is like taking a hard drive that needs to be defragmented. 
Okay. We collect a lot of data all day long. You know, when I'm looking at you right now in Zoom, I see the back of my computer, I see my office I'm in, and I've seen that image every day of the week. Sure. So I don't need that to be a new memory, but our conversation is a new memory. So the thought is, is REM sleep is when we defragment the hard drive and we get rid of things we don't need to keep in memory because we have it, but the new stuff, we add that in. So we tend to often dream about things that are happening instead of that day or what we're worried about the next day, Very you know? And, and so, so yeah. the thing you said was interesting that babies are in REM 50% of their day or, or their night, their sleep. Mm -hmm. And then it, I've heard it goes down to 20% for adults. And then as you get older, you have the same amount of sleep practically, but just in shorter dollops and you have less REM sleep. Is that true? Correct. And so we you know when you look at it, babies sleep the most and then the amount of sleep you get. That, what is ideal uh, babies can sleep up to sometimes 14 to 18 hours a day right you know we see newborns where you they're pretty much most of their time is asleep and i think you and um, i have both gone through that they're sacks of potatoes for about four months of their life when they're first born yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely you know you get to relax and they're sleeping and you yeah. know and then as we keep getting younger and younger the amount of sleep you need drops but you know what's interesting is even in children they need more sleep than they think they do you know that the amount of sleep a 20 year old should be getting is over nine hours. Huh, okay, that's the recommended amount of sleep. And you know, most of us know you've got you've got teenage boys. They're not getting eight or nine hours always, right? So um, you know the interesting part, my guys early, my my older guy particularly would never sleep. I mean, this guy was the energizer bunny. Now, what I've noticed, just as you've said, is they sleep much more, and I feel like they get their growth spurts and they're growing in their sleep. And the second thing is they're assimilating a lot of information and they need their REM. And so it's hard so, for me because their schedules are so topsy-turvy versus mine and yours. And so, you know, when they're sleeping at noon and they can sleep 16 hours, uh, yeah. you know, when they're we're making up for lost time with exams or something like that, I'm just astounded. But I've sort of given up and I'm probably sure that you will too soon enough when your kids get old enough. But I, I think most parents of teenagers go through the same thing and very few of the kids will want to wake up at an early thing to the point where I think there's been good research that suggests waking them up earlier is detriment. Is that true? Is that actually? No, that's a, that's a great, that's a great, I was just about to bring up that topic. Absolutely. So teenagers usually get something we call delayed sleep phase. We talked about that circadian rhythm, that clock. Well, in teenagers, that clock gets turned backwards. So it's almost like they're four time zones behind where you are. Wow. Um, so if they could go to bed at two in the morning and wake up at noon or one, they'd feel fantastic. And that's their natural circadian rhythm shifting. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And, you know, in the U.S., it's been a big topic of discussion because there's data that shows we're waking up these kids so early that there was actually an increase in car accidents on kids driving to school. Very they were having more issues with depression, suicide. They weren't doing as well. And so several school districts in the country would actually start school later. Okay. And they did it as an experiment. And what was really interesting is the kids did better. They had less kids dropping out. They had less car accidents. And overall, the grade point averages went up in the school as an average. You know, And we know in, in several studies in kids, for every hour extra of sleep they get consistently, the grade goes up by one letter. Huh, interesting. Okay, that's been shown in several things. So there's a big push in the U.S. especially to start schools later and to modify for that circadian rhythm, you know. And, you know, and the push in the U.S. has always been, well, get done with school early so they can have an after-school, you know, job or play sports like you and I have done when we grew up. Yep. But, you know, what I always tell parents is, look, you know, your kid is probably not going to be a professional athlete. You know, they're probably, that's not going to be their job in the long run, but if they can sleep better and they get a better grades, they'll probably get, they may get to a better college or do better in long-term in life. And so what's more important, you know, and so we've got to look at it and just, again, putting sleep as an important part instead of just, that's what I do in the end. Yeah. And it's, it's all about prioritization. Yeah. So at what point, you know, they talk about adults needing seven to nine years, uh, nine hours and. Mm -hmm. It should be all in one go, whereas as you get older, 65 or older, it becomes the same amount of time, but they'll nap during the day and sleep less at night. Is that right? 
So, you know, the data is shifting on that. So what's interesting is, is you're right. We, so I tell most of my patients, yes, as adults, most people need seven to nine hours of sleep. But really the answer to that question is, is how much do you need to feel rested? Okay. Um, Albert Einstein was classically known as what's called a short sleeper. He could sleep four hours yep. and do things that most of us can't do in our lifetime. There's other people who are called long sleepers that they need almost 10 hours each night consistently to feel rested. So it's really how much you need to feel rested. But the one thing I would bring up in that, Ron, is that what's more important in the amount of sleep you get is the quality of the sleep you get. That's actually more important than the time, because if you're getting bad quality sleep, and several things can affect our quality of sleep, um, medications, you know, if you're taking things to help you to sleep, that can often destroy the quality of your sleep. Caffeine, alcohol, you know, if you're drinking scotch or wine before we go to bed, um, stress, different things like that can affect the quality then often it doesn't as much matter how much sleep you get because you're always going to feel tired. You're not going to feel rested. But if you get better quality sleep, often people can get away with less time. So if you're getting quality sleep, most people need seven to nine hours. It's really what you need. But the most important thing is the consistency of it. You know, I'll go back to your earlier statement you made. You know, we all have gone through exams or stressful periods where we haven't slept well. And then we try to think, okay, on the weekend or when I'm not working, I'm going to sleep extra and make up for it. Yep. Well, it really doesn't work that way. The brain wants things consistently. And you can't make up for one hour less every day for five days and then sleep extra during the weekend. It doesn't work that way. You know, so the brain wants a consistency. And we've learned that over time that the consistency is what's really important. So developing good habits is really important. But, you know, as we get older, our sleep does become more fragmented. We wake up more often in the middle of the night. And we used to think that could explain why we nap and do things. But the more and more data that's starting to come out is saying, you know, napping is still not normal in older adults. You know, uh, a short 20 minute nap may be okay, but if we're sleeping for two or three hours, we as sleep physicians are now really looking at it to say, well, let's look at your nighttime sleep because something else may be going on. Because most of my older patients in their 70s and 80s will sleep seven to eight hours. They will wake up at nighttime several times, go, but go back to bed very easily, but they wake up feeling good energy and they're not napping at all during the day. Drinking alcohol, which people do at nighttime with dinner or whatever. How many hours before you sleep should you wait before you sleep? And should you be drinking if you're really, really tired? Does it make sense? So, so you know, I think, so let's talk about the alcohol part first, you know, cause that's, I think something very common for all of us and alcohol in moderation, like anything else is okay. You know, and what we tell people is, is if you want to have one drink or one glass of wine or one beer, you know, with dinner time, that should be okay. But if you're drinking five, six, seven drinks, or you're drinking to help you fall asleep, that's when we really want to have a good discussion. Cause what alcohol does is in low dose alcohol actually wakes us up. It's a stimulant. We tend to feel a little happier. We feel a little better. And then as you drink more and more, it becomes a sedative. But the thing that's tough about alcohol is it really suppresses REM sleep. So even though you sleep, it's bad quality sleep. Very interesting. And then when you wake up, you feel even more tired, even though you've slept eight or nine hours because the quality of sleep is really poor. Um, so what I recommend to most of my patients is I say, you know, if you want to have a glass of wine or a beer with dinner, for each drink, try to wait at least about an hour. It takes about an hour to metabolize the alcohol and what you drink, you know. And same thing like eating. You know, we always tell people we don't want to eat a big, large, heavy meal right before we go to bed. You know, it affects the quality of sleep. It can make acid reflux worse and it affects your metabolism in some bad ways. You know, so you want to wait at least a couple hours before you go to bed after eating a heavy meal. Now, a small snack is okay. You know, a few cookies, a few biscuits, and, you know, and a little bit of milk or a small thing of cereal or just a small snack. That's completely fine. But you don't want to eat your whole dinner and go right to bed. Okay, that's fair. You know? And then what about what you sleep on? You know, you look at... So, uh, yeah, so sorry, I didn't answer that question for you. So, no, you know, and, and, and there's marble, been... You get used to sleeping on uh, rocks in a desert. Sure. And, and, you know, and there's not been a ton of research done on this. So usually what I tell most of my patients is find what's comfortable for you. It's, it's so interesting to me how many times I talk to my patients, they say, you know, my bed is so uncomfortable for me or my pillow is so uncomfortable for me. And then I'll ask them, well, did you go and try something different? And they'll say, no, you know, and there's so many choices nowadays. There's so many new companies coming out with different materials. And so I, I can't tell you that one mattress is better than another or this material. What I would suggest is try it out. You know, and a lot of places now are starting to understand that they're going to get 
give their customers a chance to try to try things out for 30 days. And if they don't like it, they can return or try something different. Um, you know, and then the one that's always interesting is temperature, you know, and what's always been reported is, is the ideal temperature to sleep in is 65, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, and I apologize. I don't know what that is in Celsius, um, but which is quite cold, right? Um, we know usually when people are cooler, they tend to sleep a little better. You know, Fair but it, you and I have had spouses who one of us is cold and one is hot, and it's yeah, very my, my difficult wife to it absolutely ice absolutely. cold. And I always get the blankets pulled off me, and I freeze my tail off. <laughs> absolutely, you know, you can just leave the AC off for me. I'm fine with it. But the interesting part is, I grew up in a cold air place, and she grew up in the tropics. So maybe mm -hmm. that's why it is that way for her. Well, and it, it changes over time for us. And it also changes your cycle of sleep, right? So uh, typically most women are colder at nighttime when they're falling asleep and they need it warmer. Whereas we're pretty warm as men and we want it colder. But yep. it's interesting is in the middle of the night, as it shifts, you'll see most women find it being warm and they need to take off the blankets and we're the ones who are cold and need to add to it. So and that's part of that REM sleep, that circadian rhythm change. So it's really it, it's interesting to see that battle. Um, and that's a tougher one, but trying to have some steadiness within the temperature as possible can also help. Tell me about uh, sleep hygiene, meaning a dark room, good temperature, comfortable. So, so you go through it, you're the expert. What are the complications of, of not getting enough sleep? One excellent example is with jet lag. Is there a quick cure? Cause this will go trendy and is, you know, I, I've seen the studies on melatonin, which is naturally occurring, but the supplemental melatonin, which you take every single day, what's your, your thought on that? If you like what you're hearing, hit the like button. Want to share it with all your friends, that would be great. And hit the subscribe button if you want to see more episodes from this channel. Hit the bell icon so that you can be alerted to the next one that we come up with. Thank you for joining us as always. It's always been a pleasure and I look forward to seeing you again.